Well, Casey, we talked about the assassination attempt on President Trump and the response to it online, but there is another big politics and tech story this week that I've been following and dying to talk to you about, which is the number of Silicon Valley and tech leaders who have come out in recent days in support of the Trump campaign. Yeah, it has been notable. It seemed like in the immediate aftermath of the assassination attempt, some folks who I would say have known to have been conservative, but who have so far not made full-throated endorsements of President Trump decided this was the moment to come forward and share their feelings. Right. And I think a lot of people, when they think about the tech industry, they think progressives and Democrats and California liberals. But there has been this sort of vanguard of influential tech leaders who have been, uh, you know, sort of quietly and now more loudly coming out in support of the Republican Party. And so I wanted to talk about this because I think there is a sense in the air in Silicon Valley that there is a vibe shift underway, that people who might have been more reluctant to come out in support of Donald Trump weeks or even months ago are now feeling like it is safe for them to say their piece. And so to talk about this, I wanted to bring in my colleague, Teddy Schleifer. Teddy covers campaign finance for The New York Times, and he has been especially focused on the way that billionaires in the tech industry are using their influence to try to shape the 2024 election. Let's bring him in here. Teddy Schleifer, welcome to Hard Fork. Thanks for having me. So you are in Milwaukee now at the Republican National Convention. Uh, what's it like there? What's the vibe? Uh, the optimism is uh, overwhelming, even for a political convention, which is obviously uh, attended by diehards and partisans. Um, you know, I cover the world uh, of rich people who are sort of used to being on like a team during uh, political campaigns, you know, there there's an element of, of it almost reminds you of like a yeah like a varsity sports team, right, where everyone is raising money, they're all in the same uh, you know email threads, and there's a lot of uh, camaraderie. But but even for a uh, political presidential campaign, um, the uh, bonhomie between all of these people is is overwhelming, and you know they have a lot of reasons to be confident. Um, you might even say cocky at times here, but. Um, uh, obviously, the Democratic convention next month will be very different. Yeah. So the biggest story that I've been following this week in Silicon Valley is what some people have called a realignment of the Valley's politics, especially um, some notable Silicon Valley elites who have decided to endorse or embrace uh, Donald Trump uh, in this fall's election. Uh, we saw Elon Musk, uh, who came out on Saturday right after the attempted assassination and said that he fully endorsed President Trump. We've also heard um, it's been reported this week that he plans to uh, commit uh, around $45 million a month to a new uh super PAC that is backing Trump's presidential run. Um, and then just recently this week, we had a uh, an announcement from Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz, the co-founders of the influential venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, who uh, announced this week that they both plan to support Donald Trump as well. So you've been covering campaign finance and billionaires and rich people in Silicon Valley for years. You, you talk to many of these people frequently. How surprised have you been at this so-called realignment? I've been surprised by the, by the speed over the last six weeks. Um, not been surprised by the last couple of years. Um, uh, but if we had this, tape, if we had this conversation in, in mid-April, um, or even mid-May, or even like a couple of weeks before um, you know, the, the fundraiser that Trump held in San Francisco, I think the conversation would be a lot different. But over the last six weeks, you know, since Trump came to SF in early June, um, uh, the realignment has come hard and fast. Um, you know, I, I want to talk a little bit later on about ways in which it's overstated. Um, but uh, I do think that lots of tech leaders are correct where, where this is becoming a bit infectious. Um, uh, if you see another uh, wealthy person come out and say something nice about Donald Trump and not really receive any blowback, um, which it's not necessarily clear that they're at least receiving immediate blowback. Um, you say to yourself, like, hey, you know, this is not 2016. So before we get into what some are calling a realignment, Teddy, I want you to mm -hmm. just tell us what has actually happened here. There have been a handful of high profile names who have declared for Trump. Many of those people have long been sympathetic to Republican politics. So when we say Definitely. that there is maybe some sort of realignment happening here, what do we actually mean? You're, you're correct. There are there are a few people who like were supporting uh, 
Joe Biden in 2020 who are now supporting Donald Trump loudly and proudly in 2024. Um, I bet you a ton of the people that we're talking about um, privately voted for Trump in 2020. They just didn't talk about it. Um, uh, and right, I, I, I do agree with you, Casey. There's lots of elements of this that are overstated. Um, uh, I think what people feel or what they say they feel is, is a sense that there is no uh, reason to be just kind of politically mute or, or, to, or to feel that way privately. And, and also, you know, from, a, from what I cover, people can feel like they can act on those feelings too, right? I mean, like, uh, even if David Sachs thought that Donald Trump was a great president in 2020, which, you know, he says he didn't, but like, even if he did, like, it, it would have been shocking to do a Trump fundraiser. I mean, Peter Thiel didn't do a Trump fundraiser in 2016 for Donald Trump. I mean, like, there weren't, there weren't that many people acting on these beliefs um, at the time. Um, and now um, we're, we're seeing a lot of these people actually do things, right? David Sachs spoke at the RNC last night. He sort of has put himself in the inner circle. Elon Musk, you know, could give tens of millions of dollars to a Trump super PAC. Um, so that's what I think the core realignment is we're talking about, or what I think what people would argue the realignment is, is that a small number of people who do have a lot of cultural power and do define the industry, and whether that's fair or not is another conversation, like those people are... It feels like at least at least driving the narrative, right? At least driving the the conversation. Um, also, the exact same time this is happening, which is unrelated, we've seen sort of the wilting of Joe Biden's support among Democrats. Well, then, do we want to talk about are there what some of the frustrations have been with the Biden administration? Is there a sense in the tech industry that Biden didn't deliver something he was supposed to? That he betrayed the industry some way? Or, or what are folks so mad about? You mentioned that uh, this week Ben Horowitz and Mark Andreessen uh, said they were endorsing Trump. And to take them at face value, what their explanation was, was that they're defending, quote unquote, little tech against big tech. Um, and they really talk about the Biden administration as almost if it's the Lena Khan administration, that like this is all, you know, that she is like the real president um, and that Biden is... Um, ultimately uh, not really in charge, which is a kind of a broader right-wing talking point, but also that like Khan specifically comes up in literally every conversation you have with Silicon Valley conservatives. Um, um, and it makes you wonder, you know, if, if he had a different FTC chair, uh, would they be fine with the other Biden stuff? Uh, I, I doubt it. Um, but, you know, they talk about, Mark and Ben talk about her a lot. Um, you know, there's this broader um, sense of aggrievement, I, I guess you can put it, um, that... I think is rooted partially in COVID, um, which, you know, was sort of, I think, the beginning of this era of, of, uh, of red pilling of Silicon Valley was, you know, the, the sense that what, you know, still even 2024, you know, June 2024, July 2024, we're still talking about, you know, why did Gavin Newsom do those lockdowns? You know, um, did, you know, the DEI initiatives after George Floyd go too far? Um, I, I feel like that stuff still comes up a lot. Um, maybe not explicitly, but that when you, when you listen to someone like Mark Andreessen, you know, he, he talks about COVID as, uh, uh, an event that catalyzed him to get, uh, more involved in politics and more involved in civic life because he sort of feels like the quote unquote experts were wrong. Right. Um, that's not really an answer Casey though, on like a specific policy. That's like the, I feel like that's the mindset they bring to everything. And then it's not that hard to go from there to, you know, something that Robert F. Kennedy says about, you know, maybe maybe the scientists are wrong on vaccines or Tucker Carlson says about maybe the media, you know, really is corrupt. Um, once you're sort of in that sort of paradigm, uh, it's easy to end up speaking at the Republican National Convention. Yeah. At the same time, like, I feel like I do not want to overcomplicate this because everything that the, this one particular cohort has has said, and, and by the cohort, I'm talking about Andreessen, Horowitz, Elon Musk, David Sachs. All of these guys are entrepreneurs and investors, and they are trying to achieve. They are trying to achieve the highest returns that they can get for their portfolio. And because Lena Khan is in the FTC and she's trying to block a lot of mergers, that is bad for their portfolio. Because the Biden administration has declared war on crypto and says that no, actually, you can't have a separate money system that operates outside of all regulation. That is bad for their portfolio. Because the Biden administration has said we want to potentially. Uh, 
tax unrealized capital gains, that is bad for their personal wealth. So every time mm. I look at this and try to find some really novel, uh, surprising way that this uh, you know so-called realignment has been triggered, I just see a lot of very rich people acting in their self-interest. I guess the response would be, of course, um, like you know when when um, in, in Ben Horowitz and Mark Andreessen's podcast this week when they were defending. Um, their decision, you know, they sort of were talking about their political engagement in, in much more like traditional corporate lobbying terms, where you are a company, you know, you produce microphones, and someone's trying to put a tax on microphones, and you are fighting that tax on microphones, because you are, it's your job, you're in charge of the microphone industry. Like, they, they, I don't think they would really disagree with a lot of what you said, Casey, that their job is to defend uh, startups and their job, you know, their job is to defend crypto or, you know, AI is obviously a huge part of um, the Andreessen portfolio. And they also think Biden's waging war with artificial intelligence regulation. Um, I think what you're getting at, though, that's you think it's not just defending the firm and defending Silicon Valley. You also think there's an element of like personal attack on rich people that is behind this, too. Well, and, and, and they, they talked about this this week. So Andreessen and Horowitz put out a podcast where they, they defended their yeah. views. And one of the things that Andreessen brings up is he was really upset when uh, Mark Zuckerberg donated a lot of his personal wealth to the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, uh, which does a lot of yeah. work in, in healthcare and other science. And Zuckerberg took a ton of criticism for that. And what Andreessen said about the criticism was essentially that the bargain had been broken, that the old bargain was, hey, you let us go and do our business and get rich and we will sort of do our philanthropy and then that is kind of the society we will have. But now Democrats have come along and, and broken that and say, no, we don't want you to get rich, period. Like, we don't accept philanthropy as a, a substitute for, you know, funding government programs. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure he really did get his feelings hurt by that. But again, to me, the much larger issue just seems to be that Biden has, uh, you know, threatened Andreessen Horowitz's economic prospects and that they believe that if they get Trump in there, they will be able to get the economic results they want. Yeah. Though, why, why was that not true in like 2016 or 2012, right? Or 2008? Like, like was, yeah. was there something like, like, like Democrats were calling for higher taxes then too. And yeah. like, you know, Mark Andreessen, well, I guess Andreessen actually, frankly, Andreessen was like, you know, a supporter of Romney in 12, for instance. Um, like right. there's something about Trump that sort of like changed, made people think less self-interestedly, at least for like four years or eight years. Yeah, I mean, the other thing about the Andreessen Horowitz in particular is they have long flirted with these fringe ideas on the right that maybe what America needs is less of uh, an elected president and more of a monarch, right? Someone who can come in, smash the system, and in the chaos that is wrought by the breaking of the system, they think they will be able to scramble up that ladder and claim what they want. And I just see a lot of that in uh, the way that they're acting with Trump. Yeah. One other factor that we haven't mentioned yet is Donald Trump's pick of J.D. Vance as his vice presidential candidate. J.D. Vance uh, obviously is a, a, you know, the author of Hillbilly Elegy, the senator from Ohio, but he's also spent time in the tech industry. He worked for Peter Thiel early in his career. He's also been an investor in various startups. And I think it's fair to say that the tech elites that are coming out in support of Trump were thrilled by the pick of J.D. Vance uh, for VP. Teddy, you and our colleague Ryan Mack had a great story this week about the tech elites who actually pushed Donald Trump to make J.D. Vance his vice presidential pick. So I'm curious if you could just tell us what the reaction has been to the news this week that J.D. Vance will actually be on the ticket. Sure. Um, you know, I think part of this was personal experience, though not a lot. Um, I think J.D.'s years in Silicon Valley have been overstated. I mean, he was here for five minutes five years, but, but for some people, it felt like five minutes. Um, uh, you know, he had a couple of junior jobs and, uh, you know, a lot of his Silicon Valley experience, what, he, what even, what the term of Silicon Valley even really means, I don't know, but a lot of his time in quote unquote Silicon Valley was not actually even in the Bay Area. But, um, um, so part of it is, is personal experience. Uh, part of it is vibes. Uh, and the sense that, oh, this guy's not even 40 years old, you know, he went to Yale Law School. I mean, you, you all know how, um, uh, those those facts on a page can you know make a series A uh, appear um, and and uh, JD was able to kind of 
I think, position himself uh, during the Veep Stakes as, like, the tech whisperer, fairly or not. I mean, the event he did with David Sachs um, in San Francisco, um, I think, cultivated this this image for uh, for himself and, and for the party that, like, we can be more pro-tech. Uh, this is a, a place we can play offense, especially with donors. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think to just normal Republican operatives out there, um, they are fascinated, I'll tell you, fascinated by this trend um, because they think that, you know, for competitive reasons, like we have a chance to, you know, win over the richest people in the world. And they, and they see dollar signs and they see uh, even someone like Elon, who doesn't only have dollar signs, but clearly has like, you know, cultural influence with, you know, lots of young men across the country, especially. Um, um, so they're, they're captivated by this trend. Um, and J.D., uh, can be the emissary from Trump world to this community. And um, I don't know, like you could, you could, I, I'd be very interested if Trump advance were to win, like do any of these people want to get senior jobs in government? Like these, these I think everything's on the table. Um, uh, and so, you know, they have access and they're, they're excited about them. Well, that, that raises my next question, Teddy, which is about how much this so-called realignment feels like just picking winners, right? If, if, if President Trump were down 10 points in the polls and it appeared that he was mm-hmm. headed for a drubbing. Do you think these tech elites would still be lining up to donate to his campaign and to support him? Or is this really just kind of a bet by some of these people that he is going to mm. win the election and that, that, that they and their companies and their portfolio companies will be better positioned if they cozy up to him now? That is a great point you got to ask yourself, why did Mark and Ben do this now, right? Uh, why did Elon Musk, who you know, I've reported in the past, has been thinking about doing a, Musk, a Trump endorsement for you know, months, um, why did he choose at like 6.45 p.m. on Saturday to do this? It's not just you know, Trump getting support from other tech people, but you know, I do think the Biden uh, uh, age uh, questions, which I think have been often uh, advanced by you know, the leading Silicon Valley people, um, those came up at the exact same time. Yeah. I mean, another theory that I've heard floated around in the past few days is that part of this, uh, you know, sort of emergence of support for Trump, at least among tech elites, is about Trump's willingness to be flexible in some of his positions about tech. He has not only flip-flopped on uh, the TikTok ban, which he used to promote and support and has now signaled that he is against banning TikTok. He's also flip-flopped on crypto. He used to think Bitcoin was a scam, um, and now he's much more open to the idea of crypto. Um, uh, Are there other issues on which Trump may have softened his position or even changed it completely in response to maybe pressure or feedback from people in the tech community? Those are the main ones I was to think of. Um, if someone, if either of you guys think of another one, holler. I mean, I feel like on a, on a couple of those, I'm thinking about crypto and, and TikTok. You didn't get the sense that Trump strongly felt the way he did. Um, um, you know, on TikTok, even during the, the, the administration, you know, when they tried to ban it the first time, like, you know, it was, it was, it was wheeling and dealing. Like, ah, oh, Larry Ellison wants to do this. Like, um, uh, on crypto, you know, Trump wasn't really talking about the issue, at least during the primary ever. Um, uh, and really Vivek Ramaswamy is the guy who kind of got him to start talking about it a lot more. I guess I'm not necessarily convinced that it's like a total flip-flop or if it is, it's mostly on paper. But, you know, some of the tech people clearly have some influence over him. I, I do think there is a an element here that goes beyond just naked economic self-interest. Uh, because, and, and, and Teddy, I'm curious to compare notes with you on this because you talk to more of these people than I do. But when I talk to people who are influential in the tech industry who may be um, you know, more centrist or more skeptical of, of Democrats or even pro-Trump, you know, they'll they'll talk about some of the issues we've raised, the sort of the regulation piece, the Lena Khan piece, the uh, you know the the tax uh, stuff that on which these candidates differ greatly. 
But there's also just an element of, well, I, I like the people who are nice to me. And I think a lot of tech elites feel fairly or unfairly like they have come under attack from the left. Yes. You know, they, they feel like they are job creators, they are innovators, they are building important companies and institutions and funding uh, the growth of American innovation. And I think a lot of them feel like the, the thanks they've gotten for that is to be vilified, to be called uh, you know, fat cats. I mean, there, there's sort of echoes of, of what you heard about Obama in 2008, which is, you know, we're, we're uh, from Wall Street people, which was, you know, we feel like we're, we're the good guys, but all of a sudden we're being made out to be the villains. So when, when you talk to these people in the highest ranks of Silicon Valley, do they talk more about the economic pieces or do they talk about this sense that they, uh, they feel hurt emotionally uh, by the kind of way that they've been portrayed by the left? The, the latter only comes out, you know, after a couple of drinks, so to speak. But, um, you know, like take, 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 let's take Elon Musk, for instance, right? You know, in, in doing some reporting with, with Ryan Mack, I mean, it's, it's very clear that uh, part of why Elon got to where he is today um, has to do with Biden not, like, inviting him to a White House meeting that the, the White House did with uh, electric car manufacturers. Um, now, is, like, take, that, take that example. Is that... Kevin, like the first thing or the second thing, like is is it is that an economic argument or is that like a feeling of of, of hurt? Um, um, you know, for a lot of these for a lot of these founders, I guess this is a sympathetic view or, or sympathetic rejoinder to what you're saying, Kevin. Like, like the company is them, right? And, and you know, if 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 you're Mark Zuckerberg, you know, when someone is mean to Facebook, like you feel it personally. Like I'm sure I'm sure you know they genuinely, at least the founders, you know, feel. Um, that there is that, that that's a thin line between going after big tech and like, you know, being bullied on a playground. Um, so it's hard. I, I find it hard to distinguish between those two things. Also, like we have to say that the right has demonized big tech just as much. Like, go look and see how tech is. J.D. Vance, J.D. Vance. Yeah. Yeah, go, go look and see how tech is covered on Fox News, right? I mean, it's daily stories about the evils of Google and of Meta and of Mark Zuckerberg, right? So, you know, there's been this idea that's been floated by some more right-leaning commentators in tech this week that none of this would have happened if Democrats hadn't started being mean to big tech. But it's so important to remember, the right started being mean to big tech at the exact same time, often in much more apocalyptic terms. So that story just does not hold water with me. <laughs> Yeah. You, you feel like if Elon Musk was uh, upset about uh, Tesla not being invited to the White House meeting, like, he should also be upset that, you know, <laughs> Republicans think that, you know, or some Republicans think, you know, the climate change and the, the need for electric vehicles is a big hoax and, you know, yada, yada, yada. Well, I mean, just look at the rest of the like, Republican platform for tech, which involves things like, you know, making content moderation illegal, which I think would create enormous challenges in Elon Musk's X business, for example. So, you know, I think people are sort of being very selective in which arguments they choose to defend the, their positions here. Yeah. Teddy, I'm curious how much the tech elites that you're talking to have thought about what it would actually be like to do business during a second Trump administration. Like, I remember mm. very clearly during the first Trump administration, a lot of tech leaders saying that Trump was bad in part because he was violating all these kinds of democratic norms that were making it very hard to predict what the economy, the country, the law would look like a year or two down the road, made it very hard for them to plan. They also objected to his sort of strong stance on immigration uh, restriction because a lot of them employ a lot of immigrants at their companies and want it to be easier for people to come over, say, as engineers and work at their companies. So how much of this are they thinking about in terms of what it would be like to actually run or, or invest in tech businesses during a sec second Trump administration? And you could easily argue that things could be worse uh, in a second Trump administration than, than the first time. Um, at least, sorry, regards to like ways that you know the 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 rule of law is is, is carried out from a business standpoint. Look, I mean, uh, that's the argument that Ruud Hoffman has been making. Um, you know, the, the co-founder of LinkedIn, one of the Democratic Party's biggest single biggest donors, he's argued that um, look, Trump might be better on crypto or on AI, or you know, is he going to tax billionaires to smithereens or yada yada yada? But his argument is that you basically need. Uh, rules of the road um, that allow for capitalism to work. Yeah. So 
Teddy, we have some big names declared for Trump and maybe fewer for Biden this time around. I'm curious, what are you looking for next? Are there any names out there that are undeclared or is there anything that could happen in the next few weeks that would make you feel like momentum was really building here for one candidate or the other? The unknown here, uh, I still think, at least as of this recording, is um, whether Joe Biden remains the Democratic nominee, um, which has sort of been a... Uh, a parlor game or, or a pipe dream, depending on your perspective, uh, for much of this year, much of the cycle. Um, like I reported uh, in my last gig that Sam Altman in 2022 was like trying to inquire about a way to uh, force Biden out even back then. Um, but, you know, that that is no longer a, a billionaire uh, passion project. It is obviously a very real conversation that Democrats are having, and we'll know more at the Democratic Convention um, next month in Chicago. I think the task for uh, techs, Democrats, not that they need my advice, is, you know, they're really going to try to recenter everything that people don't like about Donald Trump. So in summary, do you think what we've seen so far is most of the realignment already happening or is there more to come? Are we closer to the beginning or the end of a Trump boom in Silicon Valley? Great question. Uh, I think we're closer to the end. Um, I do not think this is going to be uh, a phenomenon that is I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna eat these words someone should play these back i mean i do not i do not think this is gonna be a phenomenon that we will be discussing in 2026 or, tw or 27 um you know i do think if trump were elected um lots of people in silicon valley would realize remember what they did not like about him uh in 2017 18 and 19 that's that's my prediction yeah well, we'll keep following the story and checking in with you about the state of politics in Silicon Valley. Um, I think a lot of people in tech were hoping to not pay much attention to the election this time around. And I think uh, yeah. in the past couple of weeks, they have started to realize that they cannot sit on the sidelines. Um, they, they actually do have to care about this election. So uh, whether or not they want to, it seems like politics is coming for Silicon Valley. Well, Teddy, thanks so much for uh, catching us up on this story. Appreciate you making time. Thanks, Teddy. Hey, that's the end of this clip. If you liked what you saw, head on over to our page and subscribe and you can get the full podcast. We do a show like this almost every week on tech and the future. Head on over there now and subscribe.